So um, wherever you are right now, doesn't doesn't matter if you finished. We're just going to go now over the exercise a little bit to illustrate how we thought about the process in, in approaching and in, in, in trying to get to the solution. And um, for the first exercise, what we have is just the, the, the trace. And the question was, what are the weak authentication schemes? So knowing that weak, authentica the weak authentication schemes are digest and basic, uh, you quick Google search reveals that most of the time. And then, then you know that this is just a basic base64 encoding of the string username colon password. And Bro actually does that by default. It extracts it. But you have to give it one specific parameter. You have to redefine ex capture passwords to be true, because that's potentially sensitive information. If that shows up in your logs, it might not always be the best thing. And um, then you have to take extra care of them. So unless you really want it, it's off by default with uh, many of the PII and other sensitive information. So that means um, here's, here's an example. If you run the trace and go through the HTTP logs, extract the username and password field, which is in there, you'll, you'll see a username but no password. And, and um, uh, yeah, well, the, actually, I think this question, oh, yeah, the second question is about the password. So that would involve redefining the default capture password variable to, true, to be true. And then it's, again, the same query as above. And we've, we also get the password. Any questions on the exercise? So the next question was information theft, theft from a web server. And um, again, without having a concrete starting point, we started the investigation with just looking for something that could just give us an initial hook. And looking through HP Dairy servers, we find, we find quite a few, find quite a few that uh, Actually, we already see here a traversal attack, um, directory traversal attack. At this point, though, we didn't really know what succeeded and what not. And uh, that was the part of the next exercise. And that one way to do it would be to look at the HTTP reply status codes. Um, sometimes that doesn't work, especially for dynamically generated sites, if the file does not exist. You get a page that only in the body says you, well, this file didn't exist, but HTTP, the HTTP server returns a 200. So in the, the other way to, rather than looking, in this case, it works. But the other way to do it would be to look at the response body length. And if, it, if it's almost the same across many different requests and changes one time significantly, then you can have used the length of the body as a proxy uh, for, for success or not. So here we just look at the different status codes. And if we look at, at the distribution of the status codes, we see, well, one has a 200, and the rest are 404s. And probably then that suggests we should look at the one with the 200 uh, in particular, and, or actually look for all those that are not 404. And then that's the same as looking for the one that has 200 in this case. We'll, we'll find one remaining, one entry. And that's, a, that's, that's, that's the link. Are there questions on this one? OK. So for the third part, we'll have SMTP traffic. And um, again, we just look through the SMTP logs that are generated by default and see if, if we find anything um, particular. In this case, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, these exercises are a little crafted, so here's just one result. Often they will have to narrow down to a candidate set even further. But here, this, the, this is the connection line. There's the from to. <coughs> 
the date. Um, yeah. And so let's look a little bit at, at actually the actual um, relevant fields, which are from, to, and subject, plus maybe the connection identifier so that we can look at the corresponding con log. And then uh, this, is, this is what we get, the output. And here we have this subject line. That looks quite promising for our email leakage scenario. So we look at it a little further. Now, with the connection UID that is associated with each log entry, we go into um, SMTP entities, which has more descriptions about the actual entities inside. And so SMTP also has this hierarchical notion of MIME entities, and that's what this log file documents in more detail. And if, if, if we look at the log file, we actually see also file name, file name field, and it is advice PDF. So given that, that we were just told there's some leakage going on, and here we have the MIME type also, this looks quite a promising candidate. But how do we get the actual file now? That's, um, that, again, requires enabling the recording of the information. And as with many things in Bro that, that are sensitive, are turned off by default, but it merely requires a switch to turning them on, here we specify a regular expression of all the MIME types for which Bro should record the attachment to disk in the same file, in the same directory. And if you, if you run that, you'll end up with a file uh, of this form. I, I, some of you had the problem, actually, that, that didn't generate that file. Who Would you mind raising the hand who had that issue, just to see how many of three? OK, interesting. I haven't found out what that is, so but I'm. Is that an external library of any kind? There's libmagic. You bro uses either signatures or libmagic for detecting the real MIME type. And um, usually, maybe if, that, if you haven't installed that and if you have a chance to. Sure. Yeah. But I couldn't see bro on my Mac, at least. It's not linked against libmagic um, if I look at the LDD equivalent. so. I'm not yet sure if that's the actual cause. I'll we'll try to investigate that further. It won't compile if you have. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it uses it transparently. If if libmagic is there, it uses it. Otherwise, it, it won't use it. So maybe that's the cause. <coughs> okay. This this is a PDF file. If we. Uh, <coughs> So we just open it with our favorite PDF reader and find then two links in there. Other questions on this exercise? OK. So now we look at a DOS attack. Here, some employees complain that, that they can't access the site anymore. And um, we start the analysis just by finding out what addresses are really concerned. And it's, in the case of YouTube, it's a little disappointing because you use it as CDN. And we can only estimate that, what addresses are in use. And um, here we see quite a few. They seem to come from, from a similar block in this case, which we might use as an adva advantage and just constrain the set of addresses that are involved by looking at one specific address block. And um, more interesting, though, actually, to look at about failing connections or not is the connection state. Each log entry has a connection state that determines and whether it was successful or not, or whether just a sin was seen, whether the, after the initial sin you saw a RST, or whether the connection was terminated with an RST with intermediate data. And, the, and there's a variety of different states that, that really are helpful now to to look at. And if we look at the different connection states for those addresses, and here we're really just conservative to get a ballpark estimate, I look at those that appear to be coming from this one, from this address block. And uh, actually using here a regular expression is safe because it is uh, on a specific field value, not the entire 
file where we know we start with the caret. And then, then this is the distribution of the different states that we that we see. And um, I don't want to go in all the different states in detail, but um, the rejection rejection state means that after an initial sin, a direct RST followed. So the connection didn't even has not been established, and it was directly ter terminated. That's something in this scenario. Like looks like an RST injection attack. After the initial request, you, you, if you see a RST, that could be a candidate. For example, others, others are here, S0 is also quite frequent, which means you have only seen an initial sin. There's no act coming back, no RST, nothing. Often if host a firewall, or probably also when you say do nmap dash, dash S, capital S, that's um, what you see a lot. And SF is the state that means it started with a sin and ended with a fin. The correct handshake, the correct four-way teardown of TCP happened successfully. And then there are others, for example. Here others where just bro has started picking up the connection right in the middle, hasn't seen the initial sin. There's a description of these. We are in the process of updating our built-in documentation, but this, these, these states will all, all be documented. Uh, hopefully, then in the future, if they're not already there. Okay, so for now, we just all assume that 376 connections failed, and they probably have been um, attacked by an RST, by a man in the middle, or an eavesdropper on the same network who has short closer to the victim and could inject those RSTs to avoid connections to the specific YouTube addresses. And now, if we want to quantify the downtime, um, we'll need to look a little bit at the sequence of those connections. How do they look like over time? And that's we just now look at all those failing connections by filtering them and just printing out the corresponding timestamp, $3. That's what we cut out here. So we get a list of all timestamps, and that that and look at that a little further. The start. So if we take the first timestamp, we we'll get the start time, and if we use the last timestamp of tail, we get the ending timestamp. And that's so those. We think that's that's if that's our estimate. We think okay, this is where the attack started, and this is where it ended. And um, that's one way of getting the getting the value with, build, with basic Unix tools. That will be 35 minutes. You know, you could imagine that, OK, maybe it's, it's a burst of attacks in there. And then what do you do? Well, you just plot the different the RSTs. On the, this is the time axis. And this is just an index value on the y axis. So for each dot represents a single rejected connection. and um, if you look over time, you see there's a bunch of connections that have been rejected here, here, here. It looks like a continuous attack almost. People started to try to reach to reach YouTube for a while, and there's this this is seconds. So it's really here they didn't try to reach YouTube for a while, but or the, the RSTs, the rejected connections failed here. It's not that we have what we were looking for to it's maybe that this plot has been two parts. It ends here, or starts here, and then it continues there. Then we could say, oh, maybe two different RST injections. Like, like this, if we, if we look at this plot now, we can see, OK, it looks more or less like a coherent um, DOS attack. Are there any questions? Oh, we didn't expect you to generate this plot. It's just now to illustrate a little further to the, the results and visualize the data. And I think. Um, Justin is going to talk about that part later on, too. OK, if we look at the victims, well, we just extract the corresponding IP addresses for those failing connections. And um, with a pipe that ends in sort and unique, to aggregate those out, we'll see here again the victims and the number of rejected connections they've experienced. OK, part five. 
is the dairy stock transaction. Uh, the transaction kind of sounds like a system, personal banking system or so. Probably some web, web application is here involved. And um, if, we, if we think that way, there's a web application and data is often transferred via posts and gets in a REST-like fashion for those web applications, um, it, would, it would be reasonable to assume or focus first on all post requests where data is sent from the client to one of those, to the web server. And um, we can do this just by looking at all the relevant post requests that involve um, dairy or HP dairy or dairy stock. And then we see a few candidates, a few transactions that involve the files, index PHP, transfer, stock, stock, transfer. Kind of like, OK, probably already pretty close to where we want. Um, maybe this is the transfer page where the was. So we look a little bit further at those files now. And um, looking at the payload, you can either use Wireshark to inspect the payload or the bro version of doing it would be to um, would be to specify for those IP addresses here, extract please the contents and write them to disk. And it's the it's whenever these addresses occur and send to this client, this is what we found out here in our initial listing. Then we would like the contents of this connection to be extracted. And that means uh, we, we can do this just by hooking the connection established event and, when, and setting a Boolean flag in the connection record to true. And later on, if, if the full connection contents is available, Bro writes those out to disk, full contents. And they're also named in this, in this format with contents underscore star. If we browse through these contents, we actually actually see that here this is the pure HTTP body. And for post requests, these are of the form key equals to value ampersand, key equals to value ampersand, and so on. So this looks, this looks pretty promising that we're here now tracking down <coughs> the right road. We look at these post requests in more detail. And, and maybe if we look at a single one here in particular, we see this is the, the contents payload. OK, we see something about cookie, dollar login, interesting. Oh, there's a referrer. But wait, we see a post request that is in the dairy stock application from a different referrer. We would expect, usually, then when we are on our dairy stock application and do a transfer, where we have been probably on that site before, and we have logged in and got our session, and the fact that we see a referrer here from a different from a different domain means there's something weird going on. And um, for those of you who have a little experience with web application security, the standard attack that, that is suggestive for this symptom is a cross-site request forgery attack where somebody else includes a link to a, to a, mm, to a site that invokes a post request such as an ING SRC and specifies the full link, including the um, parameters in case of a get case or in a get, get request. Or you can also reassemble quickly an H JavaScript that generates a form and sends a post request. So um, but this, is, this is here the, the, the hint for, for cross-site request forgery. And um, yeah, if, if we look, just look through the contents, we, we see the victim. Mr. Mustard, who has it, we see his password, and um, and and see well, he has been hundred dollars transferred to Synonymous. That's probably the part of the cross-site request forgery that's interesting. Are there questions on this one? That was probably the most complicated because it involved digging into the application, and um, it's uh, 